All right, this video is the first video from chapter one. So let's go ahead and get out your notebooks and start taking notes. Let's get into the material. So I always like to start out, actually, all of the, my chemistry course with this quote. The whole of science is nothing more than a refinement of everyday thinking. And this is from Albert Einstein, who we will learn quite a bit about starting in about chapter eight. Um, Albert Einstein is attributed, along with several other people, with helping us understand the periodic table. Um, so it's, it's, he's very important in chemistry. So um, I think what this quote means, at least what it means to me, is that chemistry is just going to rely largely on just your common sense and your ability to use logic. Um, and a lot of people like chemistry for that reason, because once you get past just certain amounts of memorizing and some techniques, some problem solving techniques, um, it really is just a huge exercise in logic and rational thinking. Um, it very much makes sense and it, it's just a really nice science for people who appreciate that kind of common sense application. Um, and also, um, you know, the idea is that you just need to refine it. You just need to kind of keep um, uh, just ironing out the edges in, in your thinking and just get more and more clear in your thinking. Chemistry will be a, will be a great benefit for you um, in any kind of science that you're pursuing, whether it's medicine or uh, physics or biology or whatever it may be. All right, so let's go ahead and start take, um, taking notes. I like to begin with just a definition. What is chemistry? We're in chemistry 101, but what are we studying? People have a sense that, okay, it's going to be the periodic table. But really, what is chemistry? Chemistry is the science that seeks to understand the behavior of matter by studying the behavior of atoms and molecules. So chemistry is a reductionist science. Let me go ahead and add that here. It's a reductionist science, or right, A. So in contrast to something like ecology or environmental science, where you're really looking at big, huge systems and seeing how they all um, relate to each other and affect things that matter on this planet. Um, chemistry is kind of the opposite. You're actually breaking everything down to its smallest parts, and, and which are atoms and molecules, understanding how they behave, and using that understanding to really look at, to understand how matter behaves as, as a whole. Um, a million and one examples, but just understanding why, you know, when you take a piece of ice out of the freezer and you put it on your table, why does it change its shape? Why does it change its properties in terms of um, the ability to flow and, and that kind of thing? So that's what chemistry is, is just thinking about the atoms and molecules and then kind of applying it to understanding the matter as a whole. Um, so reducing things to its smallest parts, atoms and molecules. Um, let me go ahead and, and add one more thing. A reductionist science, let me go ahead and say this. I kind of already said it, but I'll say it again. Chemistry is fundamental, let me add a semicolon here, fundamental to all other sciences. So whether you are into medicine, biology, engineering for that matter, physics, um, astronomy, uh, chemistry is going to be important to understanding really any of those, any of those other sciences. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and start out. I underlined the terms atoms and molecules. Let's go ahead and um, give some definitions to what is an atom, what is a molecule. So atoms. Atoms are um, sub-microscopic. Okay, sub meaning 
less than or lower than. So um, submicroscopic just means that you they are smaller than what we can observe with a microscope. So we have very good microscopes, um, electron microscopes that can see lots of things, can see parts of cells that can um, in some ways even see really large macromolecules. But whether they're seeing atoms specifically and it's kind of inside the atom, they're not. They're not, the atom is actually going to be smaller than what you can observe with any microscope. So these are submicroscopic particles that constitute, or that make up, you can use either word that you want, that constitute the, and this is the famous word, and it's famous for a reason, the fundamental building blocks. Let me just underline the word building blocks. Um, of all matter, okay? So building blocks, and that really is, it seems juvenile, but it is the best description for what an atom is. Um, when I think building blocks, I think about Legos, okay? So downstairs, we've got a bazillion different Legos, all different colors, all different sizes, all different shapes. Um, each of those Legos, okay, is indestructible. In other words, I can't take a red, a red block Lego and break it into a million pieces. I've got that building block, okay? I can't keep, I can't break it down anymore. That's kind of like what an atom is. It's, um, I didn't write it here, but they are, atoms are indestructible. You can add it here. They're indestructible. You can't destroy them. You can't break them up into a bit, you know, into lots of different pieces. So it's it's kind of the um, equivalent of one Lego. And each atom, um, where did my periodic table go? We will get into all of this later, but just as an introduction, the periodic table will list all the different types of atoms, okay? Each of them, consider them like a different Lego, okay? So um, where am I? Hydrogen, okay? Picture that like one type of building block. And then potassium, where are you? Right here. Picture that a different type of building block. Okay, so a different type of atom, a different size, different properties. Um, and when you put them all together to make larger things, like what we're gonna talk about in a second, molecules, you will end up building all matter. So everything, this pen is made up of, or this marker made up of atoms, just tons of them combined in different ways. Um, you know, the board made up of different types of atoms combined in different types of ways. The gas that I'm breathing right now, all made up of different types of atoms combined in different types of ways. And that really is what we're studying with chemistry. So the atoms are the building blocks. The periodic table is listing all the different types of atoms. Hydrogen atoms are different than potassium atoms. We will learn a lot about the differences, but one of the major differences is in their size. Hydrogen is the smallest type of atom. Okay, so actually, let me give it some examples of atoms. Um, I've been, I just used two of them. There are hydrogen atoms, and I'm drawing it like a sphere because ha um, atoms are spherical. They're like a, a, like, a, like a tennis ball. They're the same shape as a tennis ball, spherical. Hydrogen atoms are one type of atom. Potassium atoms are another type, and potassium atoms are bigger. Atoms are different types of sizes. Um, let's go, I'll give you another atom that just really means can be any of them. Let me go with a really big atom, something like barium. That's a different type of atom, barium atoms. They're even larger. And that's not the only difference, but there's that's one of the a, a main, a main difference. Um, so these are just different types of atoms. These are different examples of atoms. I like to say, if you can see it on the periodic table, there is an atom of that type in the universe, okay? There are argon atoms. There are nitrogen atoms. And you can find them in different places, different, you know, locations or in different types of molecules. Okay, actually that brings us to what's a molecule. Molecules are simply two or more atoms joined together. And that's 
really the key. If you have two or more atoms, but they're linked together, picture coming back to the Legos, once you click them together, now you have a molecule. So two or more atoms joined together is what we call a molecule. A million examples, but one could be something like the most famous molecule on the planet, water or H2O. Everybody knows that one already. H2O is a molecule. So when you see subscripts and things like that, that's getting at a molecule. That's telling you that these are all joined together. We will learn really what it looks like and why it looks like this later in the course, but for now I can even just draw it for you. The oxygen is in the middle, okay, and he is joined to two hydrogen atoms, okay? Now, they're joined together by what we call chemical bonds, by chemical bonds. And a large part of the course is going to be in learning about those chemical bonds. Um, just so you know, there's actually two famous types of chemical bonds and then a third one that's a little bit less famous, but ionic and covalent are the two famous. I'm not even going to write it because we'll learn them later. Ionic and covalent, but you could write it if you want. And metallic bonds are also a type of chemical bond. But, um, but anyhow, once they're joined together, we call it a molecule. Now, even using this example right here, we can make sure we understand what those subscripts mean. Once again, if you see a subscript, it is telling you the number of that type of atom in the molecule, okay? So there are two hydrogens, and if you don't see anything, that implies one oxygen, two hydrogens and one oxygen. Um, one of the bases that you're going to be uh, memorizing on that list of the um, elements, polyatomic ions, acids, and bases, one of the bases is ammonia. And soon you will know it by heart that ammonia is NH3. So here's another example of a molecule, NH3. That's a molecule, they're, they're smushed together in, in like one symbol, okay, because they are joined together through chemical bonds. And how many nitrogens are in this molecule? There is one nitrogen. And how many hydrogens are there? There are three. Now, how they're joined together, like the shape and everything, is part of what we're going to be building towards. And actually, we will come to full fruition by chapter um, 11. But just for your notes, they're going to be joined together in this shape here. It's going to take us quite a bit of time to get to the point where you, where you fully understand why the hydrogens are all kind of down there near the bottom. Um, but it gets taught in this, in this course. But anyhow, once they're joined together, that is a molecule. And the subscripts are there to tell you how many of each type of atom is in that molecule. No subscript just implies one. Um, and you're going to have to wait and see for how I build the course to teach you how I knew that it was shaped like this, okay? All right, so that's a molecule. Let me say a few more things about molecules before we move on. Molecules. Molecules can be very small. All you really need is two atoms joined together to qualify as a molecule. Um, so... They can, be, they can be very, very small. Like H2 only, only has three atoms. Um, the NH3 has four atoms. So they can be very small or they can be huge. And by huge, I mean thousands of atoms joined together. All right. So in Chemistry 101, we almost exclusively exclusively actually, study very small molecules. Um, that's kind of where you're going to learn your fundamentals of chemistry. Once you learn general chemistry, you can start or you will move on to what's called organic chemistry. Those are um, molecules that incorporate carbon, and carbon has this unique ability to make huge molecules. And um, once you learn the fundamentals of 
organic chemistry, most colleges will then have you move on to what's called biochemistry. Biochemistry is going to specifically look at the chemistry of biological um, systems and biological molecules. So when I talk about huge molecules, I'm talking about things like proteins. I'm talking about things like DNA. I'm talking about things like um, fats or uh, triglycerides, that kind of thing. So these are things that you'll really learn more about once you've kind of gotten through a few more levels of chemistry. But um, Chem 101 is going to focus on these very small molecules, the, the H2Os, the NH3s, um, the NaCLs, that kind of stuff. I mean, many more than those, just those, but where you only have, I don't know, less, you know, maybe 10 or fewer um, atoms, that kind, of, that kind of size. All right, so that is just a little bit of introduction about atoms and molecules with a few examples. All right, the next part of chapter one, once we kind of um, lay out that is just a brief, they have a brief reading on the scientific approach to knowledge, specifically talking about the scientific method. Um, you will see as you're doing your reading this chart here, let me show you, this one down here, um, right here. And I want to just make a point that you're not going to be asked to memorize that chart um, because, frankly, every single time that I have ever been taught about the scientific method, it is presented slightly differently um, Where in terms of where the arrows go and what originates the whole scientific method and, and things like that. I do want you to read this section. I want you to be familiar with how it's presented. Um, my biggest uh, kind of focus with this section here is just, and I'll put on the board what I'd like you to write. When you're reading this, or at least when you're looking at that little chart, one of the things that you'll notice, let me actually show you where am I here. One of the things that you'll notice is that no matter where you are on the scientific method, no matter what stage you're at, so whether you're just in the observation stage of just kind of observing how um, nature behaves, or you're at the um, kind of law where you've you've seen how um, nature just obeys these very um, simple, usually very simple laws. Um, you know, but kind of like no matter where you observe them, there's certain laws that nature just seems to keep obeying. Those are called um, natural laws. Um, or you're making a hypothesis about, you know, why something is happening. Um, I, what you'll notice is, yes, this is the part I'm trying to show you here, is that all of these different parts are still subject to further experimentation. And that's something I think it's sometimes gets lost in um, people's understanding about how science works. Um, maybe I won't write it on the board, but the, the concept of settled science, actually maybe I will write it on the board because I think it's important. The concept of settled science is something that I would just kind of like to automatically reject. Um, because science is never settled in the sense that you can't ask further questions. You should always be able to ask further questions and do further experiments to either verify what um, the current thinking is or to challenge it. That is part of science, in fact, much of what we know today about chemistry, especially understanding the periodic table and specifically understanding what we call the quantum mechanical model of the atom, um, which relates to the periodic table, um, is only known to us today because people like Albert Einstein, Max Planck, um, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, they challenged what was considered settled science at the time. Um, Ernst Rutherford challenged what was considered settled science at the time. So you're going to read about all of these things in this textbook. So I just think that's a, is a really dangerous term in terms of someone who truly understands science shouldn't use that term because it's just not, it's just not really how science works. Science is constantly being kind of, it's constantly be, being questioned and challenged and new experiments and um, 
can always kind of look at what the current thinking is on any topic, really. Okay, so that's all I have to say about that. Not a whole lot to, to write on the board. But I do want to get into now what's called the classification of matter. Sometimes my video gets fuzzy there, and then it comes back. So hopefully um, it comes back for you. All right, so let's get into the classification of matter. This next part here is kind of boring, to be honest, but really important because when you are doing chemistry, it's really important to group things in the correct groups because um, there is different ways to handle naming things depending on what group you you get put in or whatever. And it's, you know, just the terminology is really important to establish right at the beginning. Are you talking about a compound or are you talking about an element? Are you talking about a physical change or are you talking about a chemical change? It really does matter. Um, seems boring, but it is really important to make sure that you have these things really square in your mind, even in chapter one, so that when chapters two, three, four come, we're not getting confused on things that we should kind of have already grasped. So let's get into classifying matter. So the classification of matter. Classification just meaning grouping. Grouping things and giving them their proper names. All right. So first off, let's just do a little aside on what is matter. Matter, most people know this already, but let's just still put it in your notes. Matter is anything that two two requirements that has mass and occupies space that's really what matter is so um if you want to not use the word occupies you could say takes up space all right so um and you know what, let's just do a little aside as well on what is mass. The difference between mass and weight, because um, there is a slight difference, but it's not something that we need to obsess about. Um, mass versus weight, let me just do this as an aside. Mass versus weight. All right, mass is the amount of matter um, in a substance. It's the amount of matter in a substance. So basically, really what we're talking about, when we say the amount of matter, it's really the number, it's related to the number of atoms, actually. Because since um, all matter is made up of atoms, the more atoms that you have in something, the more mass it will have. Um, and it also relates to the type of atoms, but just think about it as the number of atoms. So if you have um, just, I mean, something like if you're using a pencil right now, uh, um, if you're using a mechanical pencil, you know that little pencil lead? It's really just graphite is what it is, pencil lead. Um, and graphite is just carbon atoms. So if you have a little piece it will have a certain number of carbon atoms um, and a certain number of mass. And if you have a bigger piece, it will have more atoms and thus more mass. So it's really just related, it's related to just how many atoms are in it. That's, that's really what mass is. Um, and weight is a little bit different. Weight is the gravitational pull. on a, an object or a substance. So that's really what weight is. It's the gravitational pull on a substance. So it's really how, um, how gravity is relating to the substance. Now, this is why, you know, a human will have the same mass on Earth as it does on the moon, as a, the human does on the moon, because its number of atoms don't change. Okay, that's why the mass doesn't change. However, the weight will be the different. The weight, the person's weight would be different because the gravity um, is a different amount on the Earth as it is on the Moon. So, just in terms of um, 
our application, we pretty much always exclusively just talk about mass, okay? So, and it's measured usually in grams or kilograms or milligrams, but some form of grams is how we are going to be measuring mass. But as long as you have mass, then um, you have the first requirement for matter. But the second requirement is that you occupy space or take up space. Um, you're not, uh, you have, you don't have zero volume. You have some amount of volume. And that is the other requirement to be matter. Um, all right. I use the term here, substance, but I want to just repeat it here. What is substance? The word substance. It's a great word. Um, and we want to know how to use it, but this is the great thing about the word substance. It applies to anything that is matter. So substance is any specific instance of matter. Really, everything is a substance. I'm a substance. My glasses are a substance. The air I'm breathing is a substance. This marker is a substance. Um, the computer is a substance. Really, it doesn't, it's a catch-all phrase. It can catch everything um, that you want. It doesn't tell you much about it. That's the bad thing about the word. But the good news is you can use it pretty much any time and you'll be correct. Everything is a substance as long as it's matter. All right, so the classification of matter, we talked about what matter is. Now, there's two different ways that we classify matter. There's two kind of um, different ways of looking at it or giving it groups. The first way is by um, physical state. Physical state. Okay, that's the first way. And the second way to classify matter is by chemical composition. All right, so both of these are actually pretty easy. When you classify matter by physical state, um, you're basically just asking the question, what state, and let me go ahead and give you another synonym here. The word state is synonymous in chemistry with the word phase. We will use the word phase kind of a lot, phase labels and phase changes. It means the same thing as state. So what state or phase is it in? Okay, that's really the question that we're asking when we say we're trying to classify something by physical state. And the good news is you already know the states of matter. There are three of them. I know there's more of them if you get kind of really physics-y about it, but we don't go there. There are three of them, solid, liquid, gas. So you already know it, okay? So that's when we're classifying it by physical state. That's what we're referring to, the three states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. So let's go ahead and just see if I can split my board and see if I can get um, as much on this in this space that I can. So, all right, let's talk about the first, in, in no particular order. The first phase is the solid. The, the first phase is the solid phase, solids. Um, as an example, let me go ahead and give you an example. Um, one of the things about chemistry is that you should always kind of um, come back to what you know, because um, if it's true for small things, it's true for bigger things too. So for instance, when it comes to phases, you can learn almost everything that you need to know just by studying water, H2O, ice, water, and water vapor. We're familiar with them already to some extent. So just to come back to that, okay, whenever you think about solids, I mean, unless there's another reason to, think about, think about ice. Ice is the classic solid. So the example of a solid is, is ice. That's the one that I'm gonna be using. Now, ice is a chemical term, a chemistry term that is a real term. Um, but more often than not, um, you're not gonna see it written as ice. Uh, if it's in a chemical equation or something like that, you're going to see it written like this, H2O, because that's what ice is. It is still H2O, still that molecule that I drew down there just a little bit ago, but you're going to see it with a phase label. 
That thing right there is called a phase label. This is what's called the solid phase label. And phase labels are just going to be in parentheses written after an element or a um, molecule like this one here. And it's either going to be little s, little l, or little g. So little s would mean the solid form of H2O, which is what we call ice. That is the example that I'll use for um, solids. All right, so let's think about what is a solid, and we can think about ice in our minds. First of all, let's draw a picture. If you want to think about a solid, something like this would be a good picture. All right, this picture actually says quite a lot, okay? So let's go ahead and say what, what we want to put in our notes about solids. In a solid, the atoms or molecules Now here's the deal. I'll stop right there for a minute. If you're talking about an, if you're talking about ice, then each of those represents a water molecule in H2O, H2O, H2O. I just made them circles, but H2O, H2O, each of them would be a molecule. If you're talking about something like the pencil lead, the graphite, then those are atoms. Those are just carbon atoms. Okay? It just depends. Sometimes matter is made up of atoms kind of in a certain form. Sometimes it's made up of molecules, okay? It just depends. Um, so I'm going to write both. Atoms or molecules are packed closely together so you can see that's in my picture. I've done that. There's not a lot of space in between them. They're packed closely together um, in fixed positions. And fixed just means unchanging, staying where they are. They're not moving around. They are in one position. Um, they're not kind of sliding past each other and changing, sp changing spots. So that's what a solid is, okay? The, they're close together. They're um, in fixed positions. There's a couple other things I want to say. Because of that, um, a solid will have fixed volume. All right, and volume is the amount of space that something occupies. Did I freeze? Okay, so just picking up because that, that other video cut off. Um, Solids will have a fixed volume, volume being the amount of space that something occupies. That's how much, that's what volume means, how much space it's taking up. So a solid will not change the amount of space that it's occupying. So this pen will occupy a certain amount of space, no matter whether it's in this hand or if I move it over here, it's still occupying the same volume. And the other thing that's fixed about a solid is shape. Solids will have a fixed shape. Um, it's not going to change its shape when you put, put it in a different container or a different place. Um, and another thing I'd like to say about solids is that there is movement, okay? The molecules are moving. They're not just sitting there straight, but the only type of movement is vibration. Vibration only. In other words, the molecules are moving, but they're going like this. They're moving like this, back and forth, okay? They're not sliding past each other. They're just vibrating just a little bit. Um, so that's the type of movement in a solid. And then the last thing is that solids maybe can be um, what's called crystalline, or they can be called amorphous. Solids can be crystalline or amorphous. And I'm running out of room, so I'll just give you these definitions by um, verbally. Crystalline means that you have long-range repeated patterns or long-range repeated order. 
you have patterns to how the molecules are arranged. Um, and there's repeats, okay? Um, you can see the word crystal in there. And a good example of um, a crystalline solid would be something like diamond, which is just a form of carbon, diamond. The reason it's so sparkly is because you have these um, patterns to how the carbon atoms are arranged, and it reflects the light in a, in a very nice way. So diamond is a crystalline form of solid. Um, whereas amorphous means without, A means like A, like without um, shape. I think morph might mean shape in some kind of a Greek Latin situation, but without shape. This one ha does not have long range repeated patterns. It's kind of a free for all as to how the molecules are um, joined together in the solid if it's amorphous. And examples of amorphous would be glass or plastic. You wouldn't know that just by looking at it, but I'm telling you they are um, am both amorphous. All right, let's move on to liquids. Liquids. So I'm going to reuse some of this. Liquids. Um, the example will just be what we call water. The word water always implies the liquid form of H2O. So let me go ahead and do this. Lowercase l. I'll make this one like that just so it doesn't look like the number one. And this is what we call the liquid phase label. So if you have a lowercase l behind your molecule, you're telling, me, you're telling the person that that is the liquid form of this. So we'll use water as our example. Now, in my picture, I'm going to leave these the same, okay? Because actually, liquids are packed fairly close together, just like solids. In fact, with water, they're actually packed even closer than ice, but that's kind of unusual. But both of them are packed very close together. The one difference in the picture is this. The molecules in a liquid are free to flow past each other. They are moving past each other in the liquid state. They're not just staying in their fixed positions. They're actually moving. So let me give you some stuff to write down here. Liquids are packed as closely as solids. And that's surprising to some people, but they, they really are. It's pretty, it's pretty similar in terms of the packing. But the big difference is the atoms or molecules, depending on what type of substance we're talking about, could be either, the atoms or molecules are free to flow past each other. And that's the major difference. That's why you can pour a liquid, because the molecules can flow past each other. Um, so there is movement more than just vibration this time. Now the molecules are actually sliding past each other. Um, because of this, the liquid and the solid phases, I won't write this, but you could put it in your notes. The liquid and the solid phases are called the condensed states, like condensed milk. Condensed. C-O-N. D-E-N-S-E-D. -E -E the condensed states are the solids and the liquids. Because they're packed really close together. That's what condensed means. It's related to density, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, all right, so that's the first bullet point. Second bullet point. Liquids have fixed volume, just like solids do. If I have a gallon of water, its, vol its volume is one gallon. It's taking up one gallon's worth of space. If I take that gallon of water and pour it into the bathtub with the, like the drain stopped or whatever, it's not, it is actually still a gallon. It is still a gallon. It's spread out along the bottom of the bathtub, but it is still a gallon in terms of volume. The difference is, is that the, the shape has changed. So liquids have fixed volume, but 
um, they have what's called an indefinite shape. Indefinite mean, meaning not fixed. It can change. And as you know, the shape of a liquid is the shape of the container. The shape of the container. A liquid, because the molecules slide, they will take on whatever shape the container allows them to, to take on. So that's the difference between the liquid and the solid. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the last phase, which is the gas phase. And we can stay with H2O because really any molecule and actually any um, form of matter really can be solid, liquid, or gas. It really can be, unless it decomposes in the process, which is a different story. But um, you can have solid, liquid, or gas carbon dioxide. You can have solid, liquid, or gas ammonia. You can have solid, liquid, or gas um, oxygen. It just uh, depends on actually pressure and temperature. But they can, they can all be all things, just depending on what like your conditions are. But we'll stick with H2O. So gas. The last phase is the gas phase. Our example will be water vapor. Water vapor. Water vapor is the gaseous form of H2O, so that would get a little g for a phase label. Gaseous H2O. And we have this, this is the gas phase label. Um, some people will ask a good question, which is, what's the difference between water vapor and steam? They are, um, in reality, the same thing, okay? So in reality, they are the same thing. It's really a context thing. Um, if I have a glass of water, and I don't have a glass of water right here, but if I did, if I was say if I was just drinking a glass of water, there will always be a little bit of evaporation above just room temperature water, okay? And um, because, or there will always be a little evap evaporation, which meaning the liquid water is turning into a gas just naturally, that would be called water vapor because it's just above like room temperature water. Um, steam is the specific type of water vapor that's above boiling water, okay? So when you have like a pasta water on your stove, that water is boiling, that is going to be called um, steam. It is, it's like a form of water vapor, but it's just above boiling water. So more often than not, just use the term water vapor. In fact, I don't think I really ever use the word steam in the class, just water vapor. All right, anyhow, what is a good picture? A picture would look like this. So that's my picture of a gas, and we'll just think about water vapor. Let's give you some bullet points to finish this out. A gas has um, is a situation where the atoms or molecules are very far apart. Really, if you have a sample of gas, it's mostly empty space. Most of a gas sample is just, has no matter in it, okay, no atoms, um, because the atoms or molecules are so far apart from each other. So that's the first thing. Um, the atoms and molecules are in constant motion. CST will be my word for constant. That's a word that I use kind of a lot. They are in constant motion. That's what that's the meaning of the arrows. They're flying all over the place in just these kind of trajectories. You know, it's a kind of a wild scene with a gas. Um, let's go ahead and say a few more bullet points here. Gases have, um, uh, they have the ability to be, to be compressed. So they are called, what's called compressible. In other words, compressible means you can push the atoms together. If you apply outside pressure, you can push them together. Just using your common sense, you can push them together. And what that really means is that um, the volume is not fixed. You can change the volume of a, of a, of a gas sample. 
So that just means compressible is another way of me telling you that the volume is not fixed. You can change it just by applying pressure. Um, and then another bullet point here, um, a gas will take on both the volume and the shape of its container. So whatever container a, um, a gas is in, that is the, uh, both the shape and the volume of the gas sample. It just will fill up whatever um, container it is. It will spread, the molecules will literally spread out until, it, until it's full. So, all right, so that's what I have to say about gases. Um, and actually, that's all I have to say about classifying matter by physical state. Let's go ahead and just do chemical composition, and then we'll finish out this part of the lecture here. All right, so let me erase this here. But this is good. We've, we've introduced phase labels, have a sense of um, solid, liquid, and gas. Chemical composition is essentially asking about the matter, what is it made of? Or another way you could say is, what's in it? When we are trying to classify matter by chemical composition, that's really the question that we're asking. If I have a substance in a beaker, um, everything that we're going to talk about here is, and we're trying to classify it by chemical composition, we're talking about like what kind of atoms are in it, what kind of molecules are, or one or the other or whatever. So, so that's really what we're, the type of question that we're asking for this second type of classification. For this one here, um, the best chart that you're going to, basically we're going to do it, put it together on our board, but it's this one here. This, these purple um, tabs, starting with matter, and then these two, and then breaking down even further. We're just basically going to put this on the board together. The reason I take the time to do this is because being able to understand the difference between an element and a compound, especially that one, to be honest, um, and a homogeneous and heterogeneous mixture too, but especially element and compound is huge, hugely important. If you don't click exactly what this is talking about, it will haunt you later in your chemistry abilities, okay? So that's why I really want to make sure we, we get this right at the top. Um, and a few of the wording that I'm going to put on the board is slightly different than what's in the book. And I only choose this wording because I think it's a little bit more helpful. So let me go ahead and give you classifying matter by chemical composition. So if you have matter at the top, I'm basically just recreating this chart. Um, matter, anything that has mass and takes space, made up of atoms, of course. All right, there's two types of matter. All matter can be grouped into one of these two things according to chemical composition. You can either be a pure substance or you can be a mixture. And I will tell you that in nature, um, let me even just make, I'm going to make up a number and I'm pretty sure it's probably correct. Um, of all 99.9% .9 of all substances in nature are actually mixtures. It's actually really hard to get a pure substance. In the lab, we can have pure substances. If you have like a bottle and it's labeled sodium chloride, that'd be a pure substance. But that didn't necessarily happen in nature. You had to work at it to get it pure. Um, most things in nature are actually mixtures, okay? But pure substances can be quite common in the lab. Um, when you have distilled water, it's pure H2O, okay? So pure substance. Let me give you a, a good definition, though, of what actually a pure substance is. This is my favorite definition. A pure substance is composed of only, let me go ahead and underline these words, one type of either one type of atom or molecule. You can be either an atom or a molecule and still be a pure substance. The key here is that there's only one type 
of atom or molecule in your substance. Okay, so for instance, if I go to my um, cabinet and I get out my, um, my salt, NaCl, if in the ingredient it just says sodium chloride, that's a pure substance because there's only one type of molecule in it, NaCl. Okay, so that would be a pure substance. If I have a water bottle, like a drinking water bottle like Evian or something like that, and I go to the ingredients and it says water, and then it says sodium chloride and magnesium chloride or something, because some of them have extra things in them for taste. You can look at that in the ingredients. That would not be a pure substance because there's three different types of molecules in there. So that's really how you know the difference between a pure substance. That would actually be a mixture. So even though it's called bottled water, look at the ingredient label. Some of them, some of them actually are pure water, but that's kind of um, rare. Most of them have other things in them. Um, so that's what it needs to have, only one type of, of atom or molecule in it. Let me give you some examples. Examples are good. Examples. Um, like I said, if you just have pure NaCl, that would be a pure substance. If you have pure NaCl. If you have a iron bar, okay, and that's all that someone tells you, it's just an iron, it's a piece of iron, then it would be pure, a pure substance because it's just Fe, just iron. There's nothing else in it. Um, just, that's just one type of atom. Um, if you have um, distilled water, distilled water being water that you've evaporated and then kind of recondensed. There's something about distillation, I think, in the chapter, but it's just pure H2O. There's nothing else in there. There's no contaminants. That would be a pure substance. Um, let me stay on pure substance for a little bit because this is the really the most important part here. Once you've identified if something is a pure substance, so all of these things would be examples of a pure substance, there's two kind of ways to break down pure substances. The first is elements, and the second is compounds. Okay, all pure substances will be one or the other. Now, get the wording really clear here. An element has only one type of atom in it. One type of atom in it. Okay, now the types of atoms are, once again, all listed on your periodic table. So if you only have one type of atom in your pure substance, that means it's an element. So examples. Um, graphite, carbon, would be an element because they're all carbon atoms. Another example, a little bit, um, oh, okay, let me do this one, helium. If you have a tank and it's labeled helium and that's the only thing in there, that is an element because there's only one type of atom in there. It's just helium atoms. Um, if you have this one here, oxygen. Now, why is it O2? We will learn about that later. But O2 is basically just when you say like oxygen gas. Say if, something, if someone's on oxygen. And if it's pure, if it's just oxygen, I'm not sure if it is. But if it's just oxygen, you would write O2. We will learn why later. But for now, just there's actually two oxygen atoms stuck together. That is considered an element because there is only one type. That's the key word, type. There's only one type of atom in it. It's just oxygen atoms. It is also considered, this one is a molecule. This one is because there's two atoms joined together. This one's not. This one's just an atom. But this is a molecule. It's actually a molecular element. Okay, element because there's only one type of atom in there. Compounds. Compounds have two or more types of atoms in them. But they're still pure substances. So examples. 
H2O is a compound because it has both hydrogen and oxygen atoms in it, two different types of atoms. That's what makes it a compound. Um, NH3, ammonia, is a compound because it has both nitrogen and hydrogen in it. Glucose, famous molecule, C6H12O6, glucose, sugar, type of sugar, is a compound. If it's pure glucose, it's a compound because it has both carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in it. These are also molecules, okay? They're molecules because they're joined together. But you would also use the term, the word compound is addressing the fact that there's different types of atoms in it, okay? That's really what compound versus element is all about. Molecule versus atom is about how many are joined, okay? That's the distinction. Um, sometimes students kind of get confused about that. They're like, wait a minute, she told us H2O was a molecule, but now she's saying it's a compound. The, the key is both are true. Um, it's a molecule because there's two or more atoms joined together. It's a compound because when it's a pure substance, um, and it's just H2O, there's both hydrogen and oxygen in it, okay? Because there's two different types of atoms in it. That's the key distinction there. Um, all right, let's move on to mixtures, and then we'll be done with this with this um, uh, video here. Mixtures. Um, let us... Let me see if I've said everything I wanted to say here. Yeah. Um, mixtures. Okay. Mixtures have, by definition, are um, composed are composed of two or more different types of atoms or molecules. Okay, so on the, on the front end of it here, it's not like a pure substance where there was only one thing going on. There's actually two or more different pure substances in it. Okay, so examples. The minute I take salt, NaCl, and add it to water and stir it, so now I have salt water. So I'm in my kitchen, I take my salt, and I take my water, and I mix them. Now you have a mixture because you have both NaCl, that type of um, molecule, and you also have this type of molecule. Okay, so it's not a pure substance. There was a, with a pure substance, there was only one thing going on. With a mixture, there's two different things going on. Um, another example would be air. Like the air that you and I are breathing right now. It's not just one type of molecule. In fact, air has a bunch of different gases, but mostly it has N2, which we'll learn later, but just for your notes, N2, that's nitrogen gas. It has O2, that's oxygen gas. That's good. That's the one that we need to breathe. It's got CO2, that's also good because that's the one we're breathing out, and that's the one that the plants are breathing in perfectly, right? And that's a great thing. And then um, argon. I think argon, yeah. That's kind of a very um, small presence in air, too. But it's got multiple different types of, of um, molecules in it, which makes it, qualifies it as a mixture. Now, when it comes to how to, quali how to classify mixtures, um, it's all about the level of mixing. So let me just erase some space here, and we're almost done. When it comes to how to classify mixtures, um, let me do it in the same order as the book. The heterogeneous is on the right. Heterogeneous mixture versus a homogeneous mixture. And really the question that we're asking when, we're, when, we, when we basically are trying to do this last cl um, classification is how well is it mixed? That's really what we're getting at here. How well is it mixed? Let's start over here with homogenous. Homogenous mixtures are perfectly mixed.
perfectly mixed. So when you have homogenized milk, they've mixed all the parts of the milk together. So that's why every glass you pour is going to be the same. That's good. Uh, most people like homogenized milk. When you buy it, it's homogenized milk. Um, all the parts are mixed together. Now, where does the, the H-O-M-O, the homo um, prefix come from? Homo in meaning, I think it's Greek, same. So where does that come from with perfectly mixed? Some people don't put this together, but let's make sure that you do. Um, if something is perfectly mixed, every sample that you withdraw, some people call these aliquots, but I won't write that down, but aliquots. So every sample that you withdraw is the same. That's why it's called homogenous. So for instance, like I mentioned with the milk, but let me move on to another thing. Something like um, Gatorade. Gatorade, if you buy it, like in the bottles, um, it's homogenous because it's perfectly well mixed. But really what that means is that every time you pour out a little bit of Gatorade, whether you're drinking it or whatever, it's all the same. It has the same amount of water, the same concentration of sugar, the same concentration of food dye. Every single sample is the same. So that's, um, that's what homogenous means. That's where the same comes from. Whereas heterogeneous is not perfectly mixed. Okay? The whole mixture is not the same throughout because it's not perfectly well mixed. Hetero meaning different um, prefix. So what that means is that every sample withdrawn is different, has different amounts of things in it. Um, I think the book uses the example of wet sand. If you have a bucket of wet sand and you take a sample from the top, it's going to have less water than a sample from the bottom because of gravity. Um, someone has an example of um, like chicken noodle soup. Heterogeneous because unless you're kind of amazing, the t each spoonful is not going to have the exact same amounts of you know, parsley and noodle and chicken and potato, whatever. Um, so soup would be a heterogeneous mixture. It's not perfectly well mixed. So that's the last distinction in terms of um, chemical um, composition that we want to talk about. So that's a good place for us to end this part of the lecture. We will move on to, and I usually take longer with this than, than I'd like to, but it'll be fine. We'll We'll, we'll finish up chapter one. The rest of this is going to be talking a little bit about energy, and then we want to get into some mathy things. So some um, how to use dimensional analysis, metric conversions, how to calculate density, things like that. So that's going to be the second half of chapter one. Thank you for listening. Have a good rest of your day.